Hello and thank you for joining me today. Today I'm going to try the new, it's not even a new rule, it's more a new idea that we're thinking about with pub battles, and that is of graphical orders. Rather than writing orders, you simply will draw on a small piece of paper with a dry erase pen what you want your core to do each turn. Between two players, they each would be drawing out their orders and then revealing them, doing the chit draw, and seeing how the two sides are able to conduct the battle. This means that sometimes your orders won't make much sense by the time they actually get put into place in the middle of the battle. But these blocks each represent a division. By the time you get orders to a division and the division gets moving, it's not easy to change mid-stride. That's what these orders are trying to capture. The chit draw simulates mistaken orders, lost orders, and even core and division level elan, giving the good leaders credit where credit is due. Now when I play Two-Fisted Solo, there's not a whole lot of mystery, and I'm not sure that it's worth the effort. Although it's interesting, it'll be interesting to see how this works. Gettysburg is a great way to experiment with because on the first day, you start out with just a couple core, and then through the day, eventually, all these forces show up. So that hopefully by the second day, when everyone's there, I will have gotten familiar enough with it that I can really work it out. We'll see. There's, I can think of a million reasons why this won't work. But when you're trying a new system like this, the first step is to try to get it to work. Then when you have it working, you write down the rules, and then you can try and break them. Now the philosophy with pub battles is brief rules, quick play, command focused. If you want the system to work, you don't need a lot of rules that are limiting what you can do. You're just saying, I'm going to play this, we're going to be played historically, realistically, this is going to be cool. If you don't want the system to work, if you're trying to break it, it doesn't matter if there's 300 pages of rules. People are going to find a way to game it. In fact, the more rules, the more gaming opportunities there are. So starting out with turn one, the first thing you need to do is come up with a relative measurement. So here's this map. It's basically a third of this map. So what I do, what I'm choosing to do, is basically you can do, you can do most of your moves in two-thirds of a move increment, which is how far you move if you're not moving completely in clear terrain, which is 99% of the time. So what I'm doing is I'm finding two points on the map that are two-thirds of a move apart, I see where that is, then I go over on this map and I set my divider to the same distance and that gives me two-thirds to scale. Now I've done this and I've marked the two-thirds up here so I can always true in my divider to the right measurement. This is two-thirds of an infantry move. Turn one, writing orders for me. One thing you should know when I play, the game comes with the HQ for Pleasanton. This is Buford here. His commander is Pleasanton, and his HQ block starts on the map, and this allows Buford to function as an ordinary unit. I personally feel that gives Buford far too much aggressive potential that he wouldn't realistically have had, especially since Pleasanton wasn't there until the third day. So until Pleasanton shows up, Reynolds is his de facto HQ. Reynolds comes on turn one. Reynolds comes up the Emmitsburg Pike, and he gets to right here west of the Peach Orchard. I follow that on, on the, my mini-map here, and I see how far he goes. So I've drawn him coming up the road. I don't need to make any special marks to say who that is. There's only one person coming up the road on turn one. I also have Buford. I want Buford to go to the top of Seminary Ridge. Again, I don't have to get too specific. I know what's going on there. Now, since this is me again playing Lee, I flip it over. Lee has Heath's division of AP Hills Corps coming up the Chambersburg Pike. And I know that Ewell is coming on from the north later this morning. So I'm going to have AP Hills Corps move towards the south, drawing the Union away from Gettysburg. Now since I'm playing double blind solo and I'm doing a simulation, Lee wasn't expecting to run into anyone. This was Heath's division getting their gander up and running to Gettysburg Hoping for a good deal on shoes. So you know what? I'm just going to have him come on and go two full lengths. Now that has him running into Buford. I don't want him to run into Buford. So we're going to have him come up four-thirds and come out of column. Just before McPherson Ridge. 
That will look like this. He's going to come up here and get out of column. And the perennial dry erase issue happened. There we go. So those are the orders written out for turn one. Now we draw the chits. 8B Hill is drawn first. I know the orders. I don't have to check them. Just one thing here. The first block of Heath's division will come right up there, just like it shows on the orders map. And then the rest of the column will be coming up behind them, and they are still in column. Now here I have column markers that I use. They're not necessary, but I find them useful, and there's a link for where to obtain them in the description below. Also in the description below, I will have a link to Command Post Games blog post about graphic orders. And of course, this is followed by Reynolds Division. And I've ordered Buford to place himself above Seminary Ridge. Meanwhile, Reynolds comes racing up the Emmitsburg Road. Wadsworth's Division, Robinson's Division, and their bags. Along with a couple detachments. And this entire corps is in column, as shown by the markers. There you have turn one. There's no combat, although Buford and Heath eye each other warily. Now we erase the old orders, and we rinse and repeat the order writing process. Now I just want Buford to hold the ridge, so I'm not giving him any orders. He had orders. He's up there. That's what he's doing. Reynolds has been ordered to defend Gettysburg. So we're just going to draw an arch like that. You even put Reynolds' core designation there. Now A.P. Hill wants to occupy Seminary Ridge. And there you have it. Now these first couple turns are a great exercise in the simple act of moving and following orders. Now of course, neither player would know what the other person is attempting to do. Double blind solo, I know perfectly well. But let's play around and see what happens. Okay, first is A.P. Hill. A.P. Hill is going to assault Seminary Ridge. Now here you can see the bags have moved off the road. Part of Heath's division is attacking the ridge. The other part is swinging around to the flank. What will Reynolds do about it? Why, he'll follow his orders. His orders are to defend Gettysburg. Now because this is where I drew the line, this is what he's going to try to do this turn. Now you can draw the line farther than they can get in a turn, but when you reveal your orders, that gives away information to your opponent. Maybe that's intentional. Maybe you want him to think you're doing that, because next turn, if this was farther than he could reach, if he had it up here, say, he only gets this far, well, next turn you can write different orders and send them elsewhere. So anyway, he races forward as fast as he can. You can see Wadsworth has come off column. The rest of his corps cannot. Now, Buford has stalled A.P. Hill at Seminary Ridge. We're going to have him fall back behind the ridge and protect the column. No, those weren't the orders. The orders say defend Gettysburg, and the line is drawn through the top of the peach or the fields, puts him there. He's behind the ridge, so he's out of the line of fire. That's where he'll hold. No combat. Thus ends turn two. Now we begin turn three. Late morning at Gettysburg. Heath's men and Buford's mounted infantry can be imagined to have been having a hot fight. Because Buford was not intending to hold at all costs, he gave ground. Because he didn't actually roll for combat doesn't mean there was no combat. What it does mean is that A.P. Hill's troops were unable to successfully reduce Buford to spent or eliminated. And maybe they're happy just having ushered him off the ridge. Now I've erased the orders. But actually, I'm thinking for turn three, I'm not going to put any new orders in. Reynolds Corps and A.P. Hill's Corps have their order. Howard is drawn first. And he races up the Emmitsburg Road until he runs into the back of Howard's column. Next drawn is Howard. Raleigh's division is coming up the Hagerstown Road. Now you measure command at the beginning of your turn. So Raleigh begins out of command of Reynolds. So even though he's coming up this way, he can't attack. He's cut off. He doesn't know this what's going on what's going on here. His scouts have known Southerners are already on McPherson Ridge. So he's gonna turn early and begin moving around on Minor Road. 
He gets as far and comes out of column. His orders, because he's part of the First Corps, are to defend Gettysburg. And that's what he's going to do. He's going to get there as fast as he can, but he can't run into the enemy. Reynolds is going to run down there and try to command him because he has his hands full defending Gettysburg. He moves Buford's troops off to the right and begins deploying his troops in the town. And there you have his move. And I can already tell you that had I not been playing with graphic orders, I would have set this up differently. But there it is. And finally we have A.P. Hill. Now A.P. Hill has been told to capture Seminary Ridge. Moving on top of Seminary Ridge places him within the field of fire of the Union troops. Therefore he attacks. And in fact, Heath's division can get a flank attack. And then on races Pender's division with the artillery. As Heath before him, Pender's Lee elements come out of column and the rest of the line remains in column. Now here we are, late morning. Combat west of Gettysburg. You have Wadsworth's division, including the Iron Brigade, defending against Heath's flank attack. And in this mess, Reynolds' troops do one hit, Heath's troops do two hits. One hit is absorbed by the elite unit, the second hit flips it to spent. Now the other cool rule that they're trying out now, and I really like it when I'm playing with another player, is instead of flipping them up and spent, you turn them upside down. Thus, your opponent has no idea the condition of your army. He knows he, I mean, right now he knows they're spent. But in a few turns, when you've got a few more units on here, where was that spent unit? It's hard to remember. However, I'm playing two-fisted solo, and it's all I can do to keep track of stuff when I have all the information and recording a video. Now, this flank attack is not going to end well, so Wadsworth will retreat. Retreating will put him back to there. Now it's there, and he pushes this detachment back. So ends turn three. Midday turn four, I believe I'm going to have to issue some new orders. Turn four, Ewell's Corps enters. Lee himself arrives, and Ewell comes in from the north. And also the rest of Howard's division. Comes up the Taney Town Road. Now one comment about writing or these graphic orders. If you don't specify a route you want someone to follow and you put, like, defend Gettysburg, other blocks that are in that command will move as straight as possible to Gettysburg. If you want them to take a different path, then you must draw the path on the order. Here we are. Turn four, midday. I have written the orders. Let's draw some chits and see how it all falls out. First is Ewell's Corps coming down from the north. Leaving their bags over a mile back, Ewell has Rhodes Division deployed outside of Gettysburg. Next, A.P. Hill's Corps is drawn. Now you can tell from the orders that they are told to deploy along Seminary Ridge south of the Hagerstown Road. Now here you can see the orders did not specify enough room to bring both divisions and the artillery online. I'm sure this will be cleared up by next turn. Because here comes Lee himself to straighten it all out. Now 11th Corps is drawn. They are ordered to secure Cemetery Hill. But you'll notice Reynolds' 1st Corps is still kind of taking up space. And finally, Reynolds' 1st Corps moves. Reynolds wonders where Rowley is. And Rowley is working his way around the backside of the peach orchard. Now the home rule that I use is when blocks enter buildings, towns, they don't automatically become spent. But they cannot rally while in towns. Thus ends midday action. Turn 5. Early afternoon, the orders have been written. Let's see what we get. First is Yule's Second Corps. They're ordered to attack. Yule moves behind the lines to set up his reserve. He need only be within command range of the units he wants to support with his reserves. That's good, and that's good. Early comes up in column and deploys in reserve. And finally, he has some light troops formed into detachments to extend his left flank. Next is A.P. Hill, and he has been given orders to extend his line south. Boom. And now Reynolds is drawn. Since he was drawn after Ewell, he has an opportunity to respond and react to Ewell's assault. By being drawn last, what this actually simulates in a simultaneous movement system is that before Ewell actually got where he is right now, Reynolds was able to react, prepare to receive him. What does this mean? It means, seeing the attack coming, he is able to shift his troops around to receive the brunt of the attack. And though he is racing forward, Raleigh is still a ways off. 
And finally, Howard's 11th Corps is drawn. 11th Corps is ordered to guard Cemetery Hill. Before we begin the first round of combat, Yule has the option to send in his a reserve if he chooses. He's waiting. First round of combat, the South inflicts one hit on Wadsworth's division. He's elite and they absorb that hit. To their right. Rose's division on the right does one hit, but the Union does two and sends him packing. Round two. Now you can't send in reinforcements there because that combat is over. There's, there's nothing going on there now. But he can reinforce this one. He sends in the lead element. The element behind moves forward. Rinse and repeat. The fighting in around Gettysburg is heavy. The South rolls two hits. One of these is a four and doesn't count in, in Gettysburg. The Union has protection. So they have one hit. One hit forces Reynolds to retreat. But in pushing them back, they have suffered three hits, which completely eliminates one block. The other block moves forward, and that completes combat. Turn six, dinner time. A.P. Hill is drawn first, and A.P. Hill has been ordered to attack. He opens the attack with an artillery barrage. That's two hits. Bartle is driven back, and A.P. Hill's infantry surges forward. Next, Yule is drawn. It's Yule's attack. You'll notice his orders are very specific about where he is to attack. Yule does not want him attacking in Gettysburg. These detachments are outside of command. They can't attack. He's supposed to attack here, and that he does. If necessary, he has the remaining elements of Rhodes' division that he can add to the attack. And next is First Corps. Reynolds has been ordered to fall back. Boom. And finally, Raleigh arrives. And Reynolds places him in reserve. And lastly, Howard responds to A.P. Hill's drive. He does what he can. He places a detachment on the left behind Cemetery Ridge and uses the exhausted troops of Barlow's division to form a reserve. Turn six combat, can Howard hold? Or will A.P. Hill break through? After one round, Skirts' division is locked in heavy combat with Pender's division. And to their left, Heath's division has been driven back, but at a huge cost. Steinworth's division is useless. Not wanting to risk the loss of another division, Howard pulls Skirts' men back. Now we have turn seven. Early evening, another infusion of reinforcements appears from both sides. I've written the orders. This is very interesting. Things are going much differently than they would if I were just moving units. With the Chitra, not only do you know you're not sure when you're going to move during the turn, but with order writing, you have to then anticipate where the enemy might move. Your orders become much more cautious. We start with Howard's Corps. They've been ordered to fall back and reform their line north and west of Powers Hill, east of Cemetery Ridge. Now, Howard has placed Barlow in reserve. If this detachment gets attacked, he can throw it in, in line. Yule has been drawn, and his orders tell him to form a line along the Gettysburg-Hanover Railroad. And the last of his corps comes racing up the Chambersburg Pike. Sickles' corps has been ordered to occupy a little round top, and they come racing on. Next, Reynolds' corps is drawn, and they've been ordered to occupy Renner's and Culp's Hills. Slocum's corps comes racing up the Baltimore Pike. And last is Lee's third corps. They've been ordered to occupy Cemetery Hill and Cemetery Ridge. Occupying Cemetery Ridge gets them into a bit of a scrape. A.P. Hill has the lead elements of Heath's division attack while keeping the remaining elements in reserve. And finally, the last elements of his corps, Anderson's division, come up the Chambersburg Pike. Elements of Heath's division run into a detachment of Howard's corps. And they eliminate it. Final turn of day one, turn eight. The orders are written. Late evening, final effort. First up is Slocum's Corps. Next is Yule's Corps. He's been ordered to take Renner's Hill. And he moves up the rest of his corps. Howard's Corps. And it's been ordered to attack Cemetery Ridge. Next is Longstreet's Corps. But it runs into traffic. Next is Sickles Corps. And they've been ordered to hold the Devil's Den. And the rest of the corps comes up the Hagerstown Road. They have to come out of column when they're within one-third of enemy troops. There they go. 
Now there's going to be some conflict because AP Hill has also been ordered to take Cemetery Ridge. Hill's attack is made and he places some of Pender's men in reserve. Now Reynolds has been told to hold Renner's Hill, but he's outflanked and won't be able to. What will he do? Buford's cavalry avoids certain death and rides off. He's been ordered to hold the line along the Hanover Road. He orders Robinson to secure that line. He secures Raleigh behind the hill and pulls the last detachment to safety. He moves his detachments back, but he doesn't have authority to bring them even farther and extend the right. There you have final turn. We do have some combat. First round. Heath's attacking and they're outflanked. Heath's men drive forward. That was first round. First round, we then move to the flankers and resolve that. The exhausted troops wear themselves out and are no good for action the rest of this day. Beginning the second round, Hill sends in the re remains of Pender's division. Those guys are still fresh. The Union is in cover. The exhausted elements are driven back. The fresh reserves are th thrown in. Williams' heroic division is finally driven off. But Pender's division is completely exhausted and no longer available for combat. One more combat. Robinson det attacking a detachment. The detachment is in cover. Nevertheless, it is eliminated. There you have it, the end of day one. Results are inconclusive, but that felt really different. It was kind of cool. We will end this video here, but I'm going to continue this battle into the second day. Next video will show the night turn and end day two. And so far, it's been a good game.